What's up, world, and welcome back to another edition of I Mix What I Like here at The Real News Network. I'm Jared Ball in Baltimore. As new generations of activists enter political struggle here in the United States, they enter into a vacuum created by this country's most aggressive repression of revolutionary movements. Assassinations, exile, and long-term political imprisonment have left many of the most seasoned and politically educated revolutionaries incapable of having the requisite influence on successive generations of activists and influence vital to the success of such movements. Our guest in this segment of I Mix What I Like has recently written a number of provocative public commentaries calling to task several prominent and aspiring black leaders and organizations who are beneficiaries of and replicants of what he has called stealth history. Daruba bin Wahad is a former political prisoner and member of both the Black Panther Party and Black Liberation Army, and is one of our strongest political analysts still willing to perform that function. We welcome him to the show. Welcome, Daruba, to I Mix What I Like here at The Real News. Thank you for having me on, Jared. So as I sort of said at the beginning, you have written these commentaries in response to what I'm describing as a vacuum of leadership created by Co COINTELPRO or the counterintelligence program and the repression of the, in this case, black liberation struggle in the United States. You've been critical of the Nation of Islam's Million Man March, the 20th anniversary coming up here in a few months. You've been critical of the new Black Panther Party and its leadership. Uh, and, uh, and, and so if you would, take us through a little bit of this, this argument of yours and what you've been calling stealth history. Well, actually, it's a term that was coined by, uh, by, by Eric Cummins. Um, uh, back in in the um, in the nineteen early nineteen nineties, and he was um, he was pointing out how a number of publications were put out by the mass media, purportedly by former Black Panthers or or uh, individuals that had close relationships to the Black Panther Party leadership, and these individuals turned out to be for the most part uh, police agents. They some of one of them um, was a was a uh, was a young Republican. Who went underground and wrote these books, you know, spitting in the wind, um, and, and and these other publications, in which they just out and flat out lied about uh, uh, prominent leaders in the Black Liberation Movement in general, and particularly the Black Panther Party. And this history has been this 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 revision of events has been allowed to percolate and marinate because of the rise of a new comprador class uh, that we have. In, in, that we had after the uh, 60s and early 70s. That new Comprador class, of course, is, as I indicated, uh, mainly derived from, uh, from former allies of, of Martin Luther King and the nonviolent integrationist movement. Uh, these individuals and organizations abandoned poor people in order to have a place at the table, at the corporate table, at the uh, table of empire. You know, you've, you know, you've you've raised, uh, I think, important critiques here. You know, you were critical of, uh, you've long been critical of the Nation of Islam and its its as you've called it messianic approach to to struggle here. You were critical of Al Sharpton, the National Action Network, uh, and of course the New Black Panther Party for its, uh, uh, you know, claiming the logo and name in many ways, but uh, absent the analysis and the programs of the original Black Panther Party. But one question, I would like to get into some of the details of those arguments, but my one question to you initially is, what do you say to those who argue that public critique of other black leaders and organizations that are ostensibly trying to do some good is a flaw, it's a, it's a flawed approach and something that holds us back? How do you first address that critique that I know you've heard uh, and that I've heard uh, um, many times over the years. Because we're making an assumption that the people that we're supporting and the people that we fail to critique are actually advancing an agenda of, 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 of black folks. We're making that assumption because of their pretense, because perception is reality. I mean, we look at organizations and they have these nice uniforms and they seem disciplined and they seem organized. But when you look on the reality, what do we have in terms of political empowerment? Do we have an independent black political party? Do we have an independent political party that represents all of the people who are maligned by empire in the United States, or whether they're immigrants, whether they're Latinos, whether they're gay and lesbian? Do we have this type of political organization? Given Given, these, um, given this type of leadership, no. What we have are organizations that 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 um, 
that parade around and uh, and show discipline and give and give fiery speeches that the right wing uses to organize and raise money uh, uh, with. And and on the other hand, when we look here, when we look in the black community, we look at these organizations, they'll call like we had a Million Man March and we had a follow up to the Million Man March. And the issue is not so much that you're calling black folks together. The issue is what do you do when you do call them together? And also, how do they come together? When you look at the, and, and anyone that knows what I'm talking about, any activists in any of these cities know I'm telling the truth. You cannot have unity and don't have principles. When you have an organization, any organization, that wants to claim a, nas a national following, uh, a significant influence on the masses, and then it goes into the communities and it calls together all the activists who are actually doing the work on the ground in the community and say, look, we need all to come together in Washington, D.C. on this date and, uh, and, and, and demand A, B, C, and D. And then the organizations go out and they do all of this work. They mobilize the people. They raise funds. They go knocking on the doors to turn people out. These are the activists. These are organizations on the ground who are doing this. This is not the people that's calling for this, this, this convocation. They're not doing anything. So when you do wind up in, in, with, with a mass demonstration, they're the ones that's on the stand, they're the ones that's on the podium, and they have no program. They have nothing to offer. They have no strategic vision. They have no analysis. All they do is give you an emotional speech. All they do is rile you up and then tell you to go back to your place and do, continue to do what you've been doing before you came there. And then it's gone. It's done. It's a done deal. Okay, this happens a time and time again. The National Action Network does the same thing in a different way. You remember the national rally that they called for uh, justice, and they had demonstrations in over a dozen cities around the United States. But the major press conference that was defining everybody's demonstration was held in New York by Al Sharpton, who was sitting there with the um, with the uh, families of the victims of police killings. And that's another thing. We have moved into an era where we are dealing with leadership by victimhood. The victims who, the families of the victims, mainly apolitical black folks, mainly poor people, mainly people who never had any political agenda, didn't have any political analysis, they wind up with a child or a husband or a loved one murdered by, by the fascist police, and then they're thrust into the limelight. And we have a bunch of attorneys that, are, that, that, that run to, to defend them. Usually some of them are paid by people like Sharpton or whatever, and they come to defend them, and they haven't won a case yet. You know, I heard you, Daruba, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I heard you make that point in your uh, initial press conference with uh, uh, announcing the formation of the Coalition to Combat Police Terrorism uh, with Brother Kalanji Changa and former Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney, among others. And you made this point in that press conference that you were not there looking to speak for the families of the victims of police violence uh, because you were part of a, of a so, uh, if I understood you correctly or remember correctly, a political uh, a, a vanguard or organized effort to, to respond to the conditions of the community, not necessarily to speak on behalf of the families. And this is, I believe, part of the point you were trying to make. Is that correct? That's correct, because uh, we cannot allow a leadership by victimhood. It's tragic what happened to these families. But that's the reason why, in our own way, according to our own analysis, everyone is responsible for what they know and for what they, what they, what they need to do based on that knowledge. So we come forth in order to demand accountability, in order to demand justice, in order to hold to, uh, uh, to, to, to account those black leaders who allow these conditions to exist. You have to understand that the militarization of the police occurred while we we have the current uh, um, uh, black leaders and so-called black militants on 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 watch. It's occurred. Mass incarceration occurred on Sharptons and all of these folks' watch. On the post-civil right leaders' watch. It was, a, and they called for the militarization of the police in order to fight drugs that was introduced in the community by the government. They called on the government to fight it, and our community has been ravaged by it ever since. You know, Daruba, yeah. you, you, you know, we, the uh, President Obama just gave a major address uh, the other day, or just last night, in, in fact, uh, to the NAACP about mass incarceration. Um, I'm wondering if you had a chance to see that and if you had any response to that, given what you've just said. And then also, and finally, I would want you just to say a word or two uh, uh, to, to all the activists coming into the struggle now, as I started off this segment with, and to, to those gathering, for instance, in Cleveland at the end of this month for the Black um, um, Lives Movement Conference, uh, and to those who've joined the Black Lives Matter Conference. What might you say to all of that? So I'm asking you if you could to fold into a concluding comment your response to Obama's uh, press conference or NAACP speech about uh, mass incarceration, and then a word of advice to uh, those entering the movement now. 
Well, briefly, the only thing I can say, unless we develop a revolutionary analysis of our situation in the United States and begin to build um, uh, um, sovereign thinking uh, uh, um, institutions in our community, we have the resources, we have the ability to do that. Unless we're able to do this, unless we're able to, 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 to sweep away all of this miscellaneous stuff and come together and do that, then we are not going to succeed. And the, and the major impediment to that are the types of behavior, the types of practice of people and organizations like we were just discussing. We have a bogus, we have a bogus black bourgeois leadership, or bogus gate, uh, leadership of gatekeepers. We have, we have storefront militants. We have messianic leaders who lead us around in circles. What we really need to do is understand concrete organizations of masses of people around concrete issues. We are not going to legislate away white supremacy. We are not going to legally sanction the culture and the system of white supremacy. They could point, appoint all the prosecutors, special prosecutors they want. That's not going to change the mindset of white folks who believe in, in, in the system that they created for their privilege. And so the only way we're going to deal with that is we have to develop a revolutionary approach to these. We have to build a new abolitionist movement and not a reform movement. And one of the major problems with the Black Lives Matters is that the history, their history, where they're coming from, is totally disconnected from the legacy of, of black radicalism and revolutionary thought in this country. And with that disconnection, they are unable to come up with and understand strategies and analyses that will really empower us. But I urge them, of course, to stay in the streets. I urge them to keep putting pressure on the black comprador class and on the system and, um, and, and exercise the only real political power that we have in this country. And that's as a social, political, and cultural monkey wrench, an economic monkey wrench. We need to bring things to a halt. If we can't, if, 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 it's, if, if we can't uh, drive safely in the streets without being murdered by police, then the police shouldn't be able to come to our community at all without the threat of death, without the threat of sanction. That's what it should be. Our community should be able to defend themselves and defend their integrity. And there's nothing wrong with that. Every human being has the right to self-defense, except black people. We only have the right to forgive. We only have the option to beg mercy for mercy. This is a this is a coward's mentality. This is surrender to white supremacy supremacy and the militarization of American society. What, so we what, need to understand that this is a hard struggle and we will be characterized as, as, as haters and, and terrorists or whatever, but the empire, whenever we throw a brick at, at white supremacy in America, we throw, also throw a brick at American empire abroad and the support of imperialism. Uh, uh, around the world. Well, Daruba bin Wahad, thank you very much for joining us in this segment of I Mix What I Like here at the Real News Network. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you for joining us here at the Real News Network. And for all involved, I'm Jared Ball. And as always, like Fred Hampton used to say to you, we say peace if you're willing to fight for it. So peace. Catch you in the whirlwind, everybody. <laughs>